So aloha again. I just want to mahalo everybody for joining us tonight. I think we have everybody in, in the room for now. Um, so again, my name is Taylor Chang, a Director of Public Programs at Bishop Museum. Uh, Project Bonaba is an exhibit that we have at uh, in our JM Long Gallery. And it's created by Katrina Taiwa, who's here with us today. She'll share a little bit more about the exhibit and the story of the island of Bonaba. Um, today's program uh, is meant to bring together these two pioneering women in their fields uh, to have a conversation about islands in recovery, both in Bonaba and beyond. We have uh, Katrina Teiwa, who is a leading pioneering artist, author, professor, activist, who uh, has inspired this exhibition and has created this exhibition um, for, the, for many, many, many years. And it's an ever-evolving exhibition that has traveled the world at different museums and galleries. And Bishop Museum has been incredibly honored to be able to host it here uh, since last November. Um, we also have Dr. Hilary Young, who's a leading conservation biologist and ecologist. And they're gonna be um, in conversation with each other to discuss the strategies, the challenges and the solutions for revitalizing, regrowing and restoring island ecosystems using Bonaba as a launching pad for the conversation and then looking at atolls uh, across the Pacific uh, within a bigger context. So, you know, for today, we have about 90 minutes together. We're going to start off with individual presentations by Katerina and Hillary, uh, just sort of getting ourselves situated with what's happening in Bonaba and what might um, be happening in Bonaba going forward uh, when we're talking about recovering the island and revitalizing the island. Um, Dr. Hillary Young is going to take us through uh, some examples of other atolls in the Pacific that we can use as a reference point to, to understand a bigger framework for islands in recovery. And then in the second part of our evening together, we're going to um, you know, be witness to a, a moderated, facilitated back and forth dialogue between uh, Hillary and Katerina as they exchange ideas and experiences and ask, e and ask each other questions um, so that we can collectively parse out uh, what might be possible in Bonaba and other islands in the Pacific going forward. We will open up for audience questions in the last half hour. So we just ask that everyone just, you know, sit back and just absorb the conversation as much as possible for the first hour. And then we will invite everybody to share your questions in the chat. Um, obviously, we, depending on how many questions are shared, we won't be able to get through them all, but we will do our best. Um, and the main thing is that these, conver these conversations continue uh, beyond today. So with that, I'm going to invite Katerina Teiwa to introduce herself and to you know, share a little bit about Project Bonaba and, and sort of the story of Bonaba and where we are today. Thank you so much, Taylor. I'm Namaori and Nisam Bolavinaka, everyone. Um, I'm Katerina and I am coming to you from the lands of the Nunawal and Nambri peoples um, in what is now the capital of Australia. So um, I just want to acknowledge um, that these lands were never ceded and also acknowledge all the different traditional lands on which you might be zooming in from. Um, and I want to also say Kampasin Rapa and Vinaka Vakalevu to the Bishop Museum and to my colleague, um, Professor Hilary Young, for joining me today because it's it's been an absolute honor and it's been really humbling working with Bishop Museum for this iteration of Project Barnaba and Bishop Museum, Taylor um, and her team have really facilitated the kinds of conversations that I rarely get to have in my own, own context here in Canberra. Um, I am a transdisciplinary scholar in the School of Culture, History and Language at the Australian National University, um, uh, working in Pacific Studies and, and have spent a lot of time at the University of Hawaii as well and at Santa Clara University in California. Um, so I'm a very multi-sited 
person. Um, and my research on Barnaba is also um, quite multi-sided, um, maybe similar to Hillary's as well, as I'm thinking through some of these different challenging issues in Oceania. So the island that I'm going to be talking about today, which is the basis of the exhibition that the Bishop Museum has been hosting, um, is an island uh, where that um, I belong to in the ancestral sense. Um, my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather and my grandfather are all from this island in the Central Pacific. And so I just want to situate myself with re respect to this topic because it is very personal as well as um, scholarly. And it's a reflection of the kinds of challenges that Banaban people have been having in a context of displacement from their original homeland to a new island. Uh, the, the homeland of Banaba is in Kiribati, which is in the Central Pacific. And the island that they were displaced to, Rambi Island, is in the northern, northern part of Fiji in the South Pacific. So I came into this topic about 25 years ago, uh, beginning with my master's at UH, because I grew up in Fiji not learning enough about this island and not really fully understanding who we were and where we came from and how we got here. There was nothing in our curriculum in primary school or secondary school to explain who we were and why we were this minority community in Fiji. Um, I'm also connected to Washington, D.C. in the United States. My mom is African-American. Um, and then my parents met and married in Hawaii and both went to the University of Hawaii. And so our family was kind of forged across the Pacific um, over many years. And I'm constantly following um, that itinerary uh, in terms of our family history. But it's fascinating that it actually maps quite well onto the history of phosphate mining in the Pacific, which I'll talk a little bit um, about today. So this is sort of my positionality in Oceania. I'm now in Australia and I'm always thinking between islands. I'm always thinking between islands in terms of personal, political, social, cultural, historical issues. Um, next slide, please. Um, a lot of my work is inspired by my elder, late elder sister, um, Dr. Teresia Tewa, who obviously had a very similar uh, itinerary and history and background between the United States and the Pacific. Um, she was a poet, um, uh, a historian, an activist, and a celebrated teacher. And she wrote a lot about um, how the phosphate mining impacted Barnabans um, and how we were connected to global agriculture in these really complicated ways because our island was mined and decimated um, in order to fuel global agriculture because it was almost completely made out of phosphate, high-grade phosphate. And this high-grade phosphate was very, very valuable as fertilizer. Um, and lots of countries used it to increase the yield, uh, agricultural production, um, but that also had um, negative consequences on their environment. So uh, Banaban people are, are people of this rock, and we talk about how our blood uh, is in agriculture, but um, agriculture is not in our blood. And we'll talk a little bit about that because it has something to do with the kind of um, island environment. Um, which Bonobans lived on. Um, so that's just to honor my elder sister, who's also uh, um, a feature of the exhibition, her work and her life feature in the exhibition hosted by Bishop Museum. Um, next slide. Um, a lot of my work is about connecting people and place. So culture, identity, history, people, and the land. And I come from a very big family. Uh, I have 50 first cousins and my father had uh, came from a family of 10 um, siblings and our Banaban family is now spread across Fiji, Kiribati, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Um, and this kinship is very important. It matters a lot um, because even though we're, there's only about 7,000 Banabans, and most of them are in Fiji, and only about 300 
on Banaba, um, we all maintain this very, very strong sense of identity as Banaban people who belong to this island, even though we have been displaced from it. Um, so a lot of my work features my parents and family members um, who were part of the research that I had to explore and work through and be in dialogue with um, as I conducted this work. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just a little bit of a more specific map of the kinds of places, the kinds of islands um, and continents that I had to move across in order to track this history of phosphate mining. And my background is in anthropology and cultural studies. And initially, I was very, very interested in just following people and thinking about displacement of people from their home islands in terms of social and cultural political and maybe economic issues. But the more I looked at phosphate and the more I started to understand that this rock from which my ancestors came was so valuable, but also a cornerstone of their identity, I started looking more closely at this land, at these rocks and trying to understand what the impact of their dispersal meant, their removal, their mining, and spreading these rocks across the fields of Australia and New Zealand, I started to try to understand what that meant, meant at what I call a very um, multi-scalar level. So from the local all the way to the global and the planetary, and try to put these stories together to see how an island as small as Banaba, which is only two and a half square miles, two and a half square miles. So it's super, super tiny uh, in the global scheme of things, how it became so valuable and so important and so dominant in global agriculture. And then what this kind of extraction meant in terms of people and the impacts on things like language, history, culture, identity, et cetera. So it's sort of a bigger story about resource extraction, the kinds of resources we all rely on for everyday things, and how if you track back through those stories, you can see how the benefit, what the benefits and the consequences are of such massive resource extraction. And in our case, it pretty much decimated um, this two and a half square mile or six square kilometer island. So I'm always following Banaban stories, whether they're in archives, whether they're in people's memories, whether they're in scientific studies, I'm always tracking those. Um, so Banaba is primarily made out of um, phosphate rock, which is something that takes millions of years um, to create uh, over time. And Hil maybe Hillary can tell us a bit more about how atolls come into existence. But this is a raised coral atoll. So it's above sea level and it's got millions of tons of phosphate built up over the years. Um, this formation between long ancient bird droppings and the remains of marine life. Um, so Banabans think of themselves as belonging to this rock. They are people, they are called Kaintiapa. They are people of the land, which means they are people of the rock. And so I'm always thinking about how birds made this island and then airplanes in New Zealand distributed the island all across the farms and fields. And I'm always thinking about these, these metaphors for our land and what that means. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just a basic, like if anyone's particularly interested in phosphate and phosphorus, um, the phosphorus cycle is actually incredibly important on a planetary level. Like there is no life without phosphorus, but phosphorus is this really, um, you know, unstable um, kind of element that needs to be locked away in forms that cycle through ecosystems very, very slowly. And so what global agriculture has done is extracted phosphate from places like Banaba and Florida and the Western Sahara, and then kind of put it into fields and farms. And then those things have excess runoff, which then goes into all of these waterways and causes algal blooms that then kind of suck the oxygen out of different systems. So phosphate isn't, or phosphorus isn't meant to move 
quickly through a system. It's meant to be a very slow movement um, of this really important resource. And it's in our DNA, it's in our bones, it's in our bodies, it's in animals, it's in plants. Um, but global agriculture kind of harnessed it in a way that um, pushed the system so that there's now too much um, phosphorus, just like nitrogen in the system and causing problems like destabilizing ecosystems. So um, these are some of the consequences of extracting and overusing um, a resource. Um, and this is this, you know, the whole story of Barnaba is, is a bit of this story about um, trying to find solutions to food security across the planet by growing as much as you can um, and therefore being very reliant on this kind of supply of a critical resource. But then the pollution and the problems that can come from overusing the resource sometimes um, outweigh the amount of food that you can grow, especially if you waste a lot of that food as well. And we know not, that not all of the food that's grown um, from all of these fertilizers is actually utilized in an efficient and economic way and spread across all those who need that food. But every now and again, the world goes through this phosphate fertilizer crisis that threatens wor world food supply. And then the price of phosphate goes up and everybody starts looking for more um, phosphate resources. But the problem is we've crossed a critical threshold in our usage of things like phosphate and nitrogen. And it's a planetary boundary that has been crossed, um, which is now kind of tipped things over to a state of imbalance. Um, so if you want to know more about planetary boundaries, phosphate is very much um, one of those that, you know, needs to be uh, reined in and not overused. Um, okay, so the impacts of phosphate on Banaba was that, you know, the, the island, which was 80 meters above sea level, started to change. So the island looked a certain way. People had lived there for a couple of thousand years, almost 3,000 years people had lived on Banaba. And the mining that Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom did together over 80 years completely transformed the island and made a lot of it um, uninhabitable. It impacted the water, the freshwater systems, the plant and animal life. And it was like massive industry came to this tiny island and took over for almost a century. Um, so next slide, please. The land was left kind of looking like this, like a forest of pinnacles. So it's almost like you're looking at the skeleton of the island, like the bones that are left over when you remove the soil, when you remove, remove the plants, when you remove everything. And that soil, that rock is so valuable, but the island um, is kind of ruined in the process. So these are limestone pinnacles around which the very valuable phosphate has got accumulated over time. Um, next slide, please. Um, so Bonobans, you know, in the beginning, they thought, oh, this could be good for us, you know, like let the miners in. And then it got not so good. And so this is just a little snapshot of Bonobans protesting um, what's happened to their island and them taking the case uh, to, like they sued the British government, they sued the British in their own high court and they sued the Australians and the New Zealanders and sued everyone um, over this decimation of their island. But they were also uh, seeking sovereignty and self-determination politically for themselves. And unfortunately they never got it, but um, this is just an indication that what was happening wasn't something that Bonobans just took lying down, but they really, really tried to find a global voice for themselves and challenge what had what had happened um, to their island. So this is another photograph that features in my exhibition. Um, and, you know, now Bonobans today are struggling with a whole range of social, political and economic uh, and environmental issues, and they're kind of trapped in a in a situation between two states that are responsible for their needs: Fiji, where they live, and Banaba, where which is their ancestral island in Kiribati. And then they have three responsible states for mining, which is Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. 
And these five states are not coming together to repair the island, to clean up the island, and to check on the health and well being of the people who are spread across the two states and beyond that to the diaspora. So it's a kind of a difficult situation. So I wrote a book about it. It's called Consuming Ocean Island, Stories of People in Phosphate for anyone who might be interested. Um, and I also tried to figure out different ways to talk, tell this story in more creative and engaging and public ways by working together with artists um, and others um, to do more creative projects that maybe could reach people, different audiences, different levels, people, you know, students in school and elsewhere. Um, so I collaborated with uh, Yuki Kihara, who is a very well-known Samoan Japanese artist here in the Pacific, who's absolutely amazing and is a co-curator of Project Banaba. Um, and next slide, we collaborated to, to figure out a way to tell this story um, using different kinds of media. So we've used textiles, we've used visuals, we've used photography, we've used film, and we figured out a way to bring the past and the present stories of the island together in one space. So for example, you're looking at images of our ancestors taken right when the phosphate mining commenced, and I've put them together with what the land looks like now this forest of pinnacles. And so these ancestors are kind of watching over these pinnacles, but they're watching the audience as well as they come through. And it kind of prompts you to think about what life might have been like on the island before. So this exhibition has traveled to Australia and New Zealand and is now in Hawaii. And I kind of, I follow the itinerary of the phosphate, uh, as I take this exhibition to different places. So wherever it goes is somewhere that's important for phosphate mining, phosphate consumption, and phosphate extraction. So this one is in um, uh, near the original, one of the original phosphate mining plants, which you're looking at right here, which actually processed Banaban phosphate, the gallery, is right down the road. And when we hosted the exhibition, people who worked in the town, whose family members also worked uh, in the phosphate plant were like, whoa, we didn't know this story. We had no idea that the history of our labor is connected to actually this history of extraction um, on this land that belongs to the Banaban people. So I try to make connections to all of these different communities through Project Banaba. The current state of Banaba is not good. It's here's a story called the island with no water, which went global a couple of years ago when Banaba ran out of drinking water and people were desperate and were seeking a source of fresh water because desalination plants had broken down. And I kid you not, one of the immediate solutions uh, that came from responsible governments were literally shipping bottled water, little bottles of water in a boat and saying, oh no, they've run out of drinking water, here's some bottled water. And so what's really weird about this situation is this island was so important globally for this global market, but now in the year 2024 can barely get any fresh drinking water for the people who live there. So it's sort of shows how people kind of use and abuse these resources and then don't follow up um, and figure out how to repair and restore them. So after running out of water, ran out of food, you know, no more food on the island. And this is not just the Banaban story. This, these are indigenous peoples in the Western Sahara who are um, protesting from on Moroccan uh, for Moroccan occupation of their lands, which is also occupation um, required for extracting phosphate for global markets. And the other interesting thing is that um, phosphate is not just important for global agriculture and for fertilizer. It is now critical 
in the semiconductor industry. So it's critical to tech and the phosphoric acid that you can get out of mining phosphate is something that is utilized in these semiconductors. So now, even though the island's quite ruined and needs a lot of cleanup, there are companies that are still interested in remining whatever is left because there is very, very high grade phosphate and that high grade phosphate is very, very useful for technology. So there's a lot of interest still about Bunaba. So in terms of this question then of how do we repair an island and, and my question as well, which is how we repair a, a community because Bunaban still suffer all kinds of uh, different challenges, as I've mentioned, uh, particularly on Rambi Island, we're just constantly falling through the cracks. I, I thought, you know, telling this story through the exhibition would be, you know, one way of kind of reaching broader audiences. And this is what um, Bishop Museum has been amazing for helping us with. Um, and I just want to show the next slide, which is just, just to make sure I acknowledge all the amazing people and staff and, you know, sponsors. And I know this is actually not all of the sponsors who are involved. Um, and this is just a tiny corner of the team who worked together with me to put it up. You still have Taylor and her whole team and so many other corners of Bishop Museum who made this happen. But these are some of the key um, curators and our installer who kind of worked on the project. Um, and we made, we made, if we go to the next slide, we made probably what for me is the most complex version of Project Barnaba, which really attempts to think about how we can recreate an island in another form. So for me, Project Barnaba isn't just this educational thing which says, oh, here's the story of the island, I go away and think about it. The way it's constructed is in a way trying to reconstruct the island itself with the with the with the flora and the fauna and the rocks and the people and the lives and expressions of culture all coming together in one space. And so our our island is always growing and becoming more complex as we do we move to different um, galleries. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also created a new map for Project Barnaba that just kind of shows how our island is connected to the rest of the world. So this is a global map. This shows the flows of Bunaban phosphate to particular sites of consumption, but then it also shows you globally where the rest of the phosphate in the world is located in those dark gray areas. And again, phosphate is not something most people know much about at all. Um, so I think it's an important sort of scientific literacy that we all need to, you know, be upskilled about. Um, next slide, please. If you're keen to actually see a version of this exhibition, you can watch it on YouTube. We have a walkthrough that will take you on a journey through the whole um, exhibition. So please do check that out. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that there are many Banaban leaders and activists and elders and youth on the ground really trying um, to fight for Banaban rights and also to prevent any future mining of the island because we need to figure out ways to actually safeguard and protect this island and prevent the possibility of any future mining because it's already pretty ruined. But the, like I said, there's so much interest on remining the island. So uh, Ray Baintes and Pelenice Alofa and my sister Maria and many, many others have been working tirelessly on the ground, collaborating to figure out solutions um, to this problem. But probably the one, the group that we haven't been able to talk to in any depth are people like Hillary and others, people who kind of like have been working on repairing and restoring and recovering islands all over the Pacific. And Bunnabins, like us, we need to sit down and have these conversations with people like her and also a few other people that I've been um, increasingly talking with in New Zealand and Australia about how to solve some of these um, issues. So we have people like um, ICAD uh, based out of New Zealand who've been working more on the political um, and citizenship problems that Bonobans have had. And then my final slide 
Um, I've been talking to people like Alistair Phillips, um, who thinks a lot about how to repair and regrow um, different uh, landscapes, particularly from an ecological and plant-based um, approach. And he's put together some amazing possibilities for thinking about how to restore Banaba in terms of pre-mining uh, plants and but not just saying, oh, let's make Banaba the way it used to be. It's impossible to do that because literally the soil is gone. And so what a lot of Banabans think is, oh, should we just fill in the holes in the soil? Do we just need to get some soil and sand from somewhere else and plonk it in those holes that I've showed everyone here? That's been their version of restoration and recovery. And by talking to people like Alastair and Hillary and others, I'm like, oh, actually the way we recover this landscape isn't by filling in all the holes because you actually need a, a layer of soil and plants that allows water to move through the system so that you can have fresh drinking water collected underground for people and it needs to be filtered. Um, and you also need to bring back the animal life, the birds and other species that kind of work together with these plants in order to make things happen. So you can't fix this island overnight. You can't just like fill in some holes and build some houses. You actually have to think about it in a holistic, integrated, sustainable way and in a slow fashion. So I just want to uh, acknowledge Rob Kuiman and Alistair Phillips for brainstorming around this issue. And this is kind of what brought me together with um, Hillary, because that kind of piqued my interest. And I mentioned it to Bishop Museum. And so they've connected us now to how, you know, to take this conversation to the next level, because I don't think this is just an issue for Banaba, obviously. <laughs> We're going to have devastated landscapes all over the place due to climate change and a whole bunch of other things. So if we can heal and repair Banaba, maybe we can heal and repair some other really, really difficult um, landscapes. But this is our starting point. So I'm just going to stop there. And I'm sure I've, I've definitely gone over time, but just acknowledging that this kind of conversation is so valuable for our communities. And, you know, so we stop destroying our islands. Kampas in Rapa Vinaka and handing over to Hillary. Mahalo Nui Kati. And yeah, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Hillary Young to share more about a work being done on uh, in atoll restoration um, and other places in the Pacific. Um, so just give us a moment. We're going to just transition our presentations. Oh, and I think you're still on mute, Hillary. Can you see that all right now? Yes, that's perfect. Uh, wonderful. Well, yes. Yeah, so um, my name is Hillary Young. I'm a professor at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and I've been working out on atolls and islands for a couple of decades now. Um, I don't have the deep history of Katerina. Thank you very much for um, working with me on this, Katerina. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and Bishop Museum. Thank you for hosting this. Um, but I have been thinking a lot about how do you restore islands, not an island like Banaba, um, but other atolls. And um, and I think that, you know, Banaba poses some really unique challenges that Katarina has um, highlighted, but I, I feel like it's worth stepping back and looking at some of these other stories of atolls and islands to think about how do we restore a place? You know, what is, is there um, opportunity for hope? Like, are, are these places that we, that we hear about with these extreme challenges kind of, do they need to be written off? Or what I would argue is that they actually are, are models of hope for from bigger places where we're facing um, equally large, if maybe less in your face challenges. Um, so I think atolls are a great place to do this. Atolls, if you, if you think of atolls at all, which maybe you do on Hawaii, but in the rest of um, the US, we often don't. Um, the only spots they have in our imagination are, are kind of either as these tropical paradises that you might go to on a, a vacation um, 
or otherwise, um, as maybe what you're hearing about in, you know, in light of climate change, some doomed island that's going to sink under rising seas and is kind of hopeless, and maybe we should write it off. Um, and in both contexts, you often think of them as far away and um, really not something that, that you personally need to worry or think about. Um, and, and maybe not very important in the global context. And so I, I'd like to start to try to try to change your mind about some of those things by thinking um, about atolls more generally and what their place is in the world. So this is just a map of the at tropical islands and atolls of the Pacific. And um, I think a couple of things hop out, pop out of this map. Um, one is that there's a whole lot of islands across the Pacific. And if you start thinking of islands as influencing the seascapes around them, which they do profoundly for hundreds of miles around each island, you get these um, effects on ocean productivity, on the creatures that use them. You can see that the footprint of these islands um, could be as large um, as, as many of the continental footprints in these areas. What you also see is that atolls make up more than there's there's about 320 atolls out there in the world. They make up about a third of the world's tropical islands. Um, they're the most common and widely distributed landform across the entire Pacific. And while they have a, a small actual physical land area, you know, Katarina was telling us about, um, you know, kind of two and a half miles of land, they have these enormous footprints, as I was mentioning, on the ocean. So um, they are uh, important resting spots for land animals, but they also um, then drive these massive upwellings and eddies in the ocean that um, support uh, dramatically changed ocean productivity um, in and increase the ocean productivity in the most nutrient poor waters of the world, which are these tropical ocean waters. So they actually are supporting our fisheries across the Central Pacific, um, which are really an important part of our global fishery trade. Um, so what is an atoll? Just kind of let me step back into the geology, and this becomes a little bit important when you think about Bonaba and, and how it's so unique from some of the other places that we're going to be talking about too. Um, so for those of you guys who aren't familiar with what an atoll is and how it's formed, um, it's an old volcano that's sunken. So the volcano comes up after some period of time, um, the plate tectonics change and it no longer erupts. And then it slowly sinks back into the sea. It could be through plate movement, or it could just be through um, natural erosion processes. But while the atoll itself, the island itself is sinking, um, the reef is growing up along the side of it. And um, then as the reef reaches the surface, it starts filling in with sand, and then trees and um, soil can form on top of that sand. And it can form really, really quickly. So soil can form in a matter of a few years on atolls. Um, and it's because seabirds use these atolls and they bring, so, so the, what makes an atoll is, is coral. It's made of the coral that's growing up on the sides of these volcanoes, which has no nutrients, no nitrogen, no phosphorus to support um, plant life. But when the birds sit on it and poop, um, they start creating soil. And very quickly, in a matter of years, you can get um, some very quick soil formation on atolls. And then you have these broadly, these dispersed plants um, that settle on atolls and start set, putting down roots and making structure. And um, you get these, these communities that can form quite quickly. Um, in fact, 85 to 95% to of the world's atolls today have been around um, for less than a few thousand years. So brand new, many of the world's atolls are, are less than a thousand years old. And in fact, the formation of atolls has probably um, changed how Polynesians voyaged across the Pacific because all those atolls that we see today weren't there when they started voyaging. So we're talking about really, really young ecosystems. Um, now you may scratch your head at that and say, but like, how does that work? Um, these volcanoes didn't form a thousand years ago. This didn't happen, these reefs didn't grow up. Um, and the thing about atolls is that they um, grow and subside many times over history. So when sea levels go up, um, sometimes the sea levels go up so fast that the atoll sinks below the sea, but they can grow so fast because they're made of coral, or at least in a healthy environment where coral can grow, they grow and recover really fast. Um, so they spend um, very little of their actual um, life of an atoll is underwater, even though sea levels may rise many, many times and cause them to sink. So um, 
atolls have risen. This map here on the bottom left is actually just showing you these cycles of rising and falling and sinking um, below the ocean's level and how they come back again and again. And it's showing you here, um, and I should highlight that this work, by the way, uh, this lovely figures and stuff are from a, a wonderful colleague of mine from named Sebastian Stable, who um, just put these figures out recently. Um, but what you can see here in the lower right is that these atolls are recovering um, back up to um, being above the sea very recently. And these whole ecosystems that you see on most atolls are so young. The soil reformed, everything on them came from nothing in just a few hundred to a few thousand years. Um, now, there are a few atolls that are exceptions to this story of being so young, and Banaba is one of them. Um, and so the, the story with that is that occasionally what happens um, is that as these atolls form, um, the tectonic processes keep pushing them up. So after they've formed some kind of plate tectonics under underneath them pushes that atoll back up and it stays um, uplifted. And so these uplifted atolls can have really, really different geological histories um, than, than the rest of the atolls. So um, the oldest atoll that I'm aware of is 4 million years old. So, so really a different kind of duration that we're talking about. Um, than than most of these atolls in the world. And so some of what I'm going to talk about in island restoration won't translate perfectly and directly um, to these systems. But I think that this idea that atolls are inherently very resilient systems that can grow quickly because they're used to, um, in the kind of geological sense, being out in the middle of nowhere and growing and falling all the time. It means that the like the plant communities and the animal communities and the soil processes that happen on atolls um, are evolved to happen very, very quickly. It, it, it's something that um, ha does occur repeatedly again and again in short time durations. Um, so while Ban Banaba is not a typical atoll uh, for most atolls in the system, it's going to have many of the same processes. Mm -hmm. So the other thing when you think of when you talk about atolls um, and people picture them in their minds as these remote and far away places is they often think of them as um, depauperate of any life. Uh, when I was talking to Katerina just a few minutes ago uh, before this talk, she was saying that they read had this beautiful report on Bonaba um, about everything oh, about Bonaba. I clipped the corner. It just grew up. Oh no. I think somebody's not yeah, muted, by the way. In any case, uh, so that's not the case. Um, these islands are really important hotspots for wildlife. They are, there are 28 million seabirds, more or less, that call atolls homes. That's about 37 species. That means that 25% of the atolls of the world are going to qualify as important bird areas. Um, and it's also, in addition to these seabirds, uh, critical stopping grounds, uh, stopover grounds for many shorebirds as well. And, and passerine birds. Um, there are endemic species that live on many of these atolls. And these seabirds are really important, um, not only because for, for their intrinsic biological value, but because they're bringing these nutrients to the islands, right? These are what transform these calcium carbonate, coral, rubble, nothingness to rich, productive soils that can support um, an and a whole ecosystem there. And um, these atolls are also important um, habitats for other species that transform these once kind of depauperate coral land, sand landscapes like crabs. So it's the world's largest land invertebrate, the coconut crab, um, huge uh, numbers of burrowing and digging crabs that bioperturb, they bury the leaves that grow, they help make soils. So you have these like vibrant wildlife communities on these atolls. Um, endangered sea turtles um, are out there. Historically, we're probably providing a lot of nutrients to these landscapes through their eggs um, as well. So these kind of vibrant wildlife communities are out in the system. Um, and they're transforming these systems and really bringing them to life. Um, it's not, of course, only the animals, the plants out there are really um, specially adapted and um, have unique uh, ways of making an atoll life work when you're starting from nothing. So this tree, Pisonia grandis, is one of the most common atoll dominant tree species. It's specially evolved with really shallow roots, so it can grow just in that top layer of soil that has bird poop. 
It has special mycorrhizal associations, so these little funguses that live on its roots that are really good at dealing with the acid from bird poop and that can very quickly make soil. The leaves fall down very, very quickly. They're not worried about defending themselves from herbivores because there aren't any on these big atolls. And they're just really high nutritious leaves that fall down and make litter and soil really, really fast. Um, so kind of special plant communities that have evolved. And these these particular trees are pretty cool. They've evolved sticky seeds that stick to birds' feathers so they can move from atoll to atoll really quickly um, on the seabirds themselves that nest in their leaves. And then, um, you know, I hardly have to mention because we usually do think of this, but atolls then support these incredible coral reefs around them. Um, and these coral reefs um, are Almost every atoll in the world is part of a biodiversity hotspot in the water. Um, incredible endemic biodiversity because these reefs have grown up that whole time. They don't get set and reset by rising oceans. They grow up kind of in the middle of nothing with these kind of endemic hotspots of biodiversity. Um, what you may not know is that the wildlife on land is supporting these reefs. So there's really cool um, research out there that shows that basically corals grow faster, fish grow faster, um, the the, out, the competition between coral and algae changes because when there are seabirds there. So seabirds pooping on land runs off into the reef and makes that reef ecosystem tick as well. In fact, some work that I did with my husband, um, we followed up and we tracked manta rays um, on islands with and without um, native plant populations. And the native plant populations support the birds and the birds um, make poop that support the plankton that keep manta rays coming to islands only that have seabirds. So this system is um, really connected. And not only is the land influencing the sea, but the sea obviously is continuing to make that land. So if the, the coral that continues to grow up as climate as seas rise um, is driven by having a healthy coral environment. So if you don't keep your reef healthy, it can't keep making coral to keep a, um, accreting on land and keeping those um, islands growing. And so one of the things that we've been working on and storytelling about is trying to say like, these atolls aren't doomed to sink beneath the sea. Um, these low lying atolls, not like Bonaba, but the, one of the big worries about atolls is, is that they're gonna sink because they can actually create really fast. They can grow much, much faster than what we're seeing as predicted levels of sea level rise um, in the next 50 to 100 years. But they can only do that if we keep their reefs healthy, um, which means keeping their seabird populations healthy, um, if we don't build seawalls, if we don't develop the coastlines in such a way that these natural processes can't happen. Um, and so kind of these ecosystems are, I guess, not um, static in the way that we often think of continental systems as. Atolls are, um, I think, unique in two ways. One is this kind of, they're not meant to be static. They're always changing and growing and moving over time, but they're also much more connected than any, I mean, all ecosystems are connected. It's one of the stories I try to tell through my research all the time that we can't see little ecosystems in a box and think they're, you know, we can wall up a, a park and that it's going to be okay. It doesn't work that way. But islands are the places you see that kind of most clearly and atolls are like an island on steroids, right? Everything is so intimately connected because of this small area. And so we have to protect um, all of these processes in order to protect the island. And of course, the other thing about atolls is that they're not out in the middle of nowhere. They're not um, abandoned, desolate places, but they're actually home to a quarter million people around the world. Um, and these people are intimately dependent upon the kind of the health of both these land and sea ecosystems. So um, as, if you deplete these population, these kind of wildlife communities, um, these people can't continue to have their livelihoods. And, um, and we're changing these islands and atolls really fast. So climate change is the one that gets talked about all the time, but I would say point out that um, as Katarina has been telling us through the story of Banaba, um, kind of atolls were one of the kind of biggest victims of colonialization um, and kind of exploitation. So this is a picture of another atoll called Palmyra Atoll, where I have done a lot of my research. Um, it was, was a um, U.S. Uh, Army base in World War II, and it was also used as a copra plantation, copra's uh, coconuts. Um, for those who don't know, 
Um, but what you can see here, maybe if you look at this or you know what you're looking at, this is not a typical atoll uh, shape. There's kind of some islands in the middle. There, there shouldn't be islands in the middle, right? Like that's where the caldera of the volcano was. Those are islands that um, were built by the army. They drudged up the center of the lagoon and they plopped those islands down in the middle of the atoll so that they could have a place to run their fighter uh, planes on and off of. They called those the fighter strips. They built a road across the center of the atoll. They dug a big, um, uh, that caught that um, channel in the front, they dug a big hole into the central lagoon so that uh, they could get their ships in and out. Really, I mean, dramatically changed the ecology of these islands. And that was really only the start of it. Um, in addition to that, they introduced tons of invasive species. So that guy up there, that rat, Rattus ratus, is the world's most um, probably uh, negative uh, uh, introduced species across uh, the world and certainly across islands in terms of how many species it's killed, how many extinctions it's caused. Um, there was huge amount of fishing pressure. They developed, uh, they put in um, all kinds of structures and changes to the seawall. They made that lagoon anoxic by, by changing the hydrology of it. So um, it all the corals in that lagoon died. Um, and it just became this completely transformed place. And this is really just one set of things that people have done to atolls. Um, there's the phosphate mining. I have a picture of that in the lower bottom. There's um, full on resort development, which has um, completely broken down the process, the possibilities for atolls to change in natural ways. Um, you know, basically we've, we've changed atolls in so many ways. And, and now most recently we're putting them under this kind of existential threat of climate change in which these kind of local stressors are being um, dramatically exacerbated by global stressors. Um, you know, because, for example, in this case, we can't accrete these natural processes can't happen. Um, one kind of story I want to tell, though, about hope and possibility, um, but maybe also unexpected consequences is one of a global change that's happened across atolls, which is the introduce, introduction of coconuts, or I should say the mass planting of coconuts. So uh, not worth discussing how coconuts get to islands, um, atolls, the story is different at every atoll, but suffice to say that coconuts were planted en masse, mostly by colonizers. So um, they were usually fringing species that were at the edge of um, atolls. And then colonizers came and at the time, um, coconut oil was really important as a source of energy. And so they planted coconut oil everywhere to get um, this kind of food product out, this copra plantation. And today, if you look at um, the world's atolls around the world, um, you can see this map. So this is a close up of, a, of some of the atolls of the world. And you can see those colors, those all those dots are some of the world's atolls. And those colors are how much of that world of the atoll is covered in coconuts. Um, and what you can see is we're talking about more than 50% of the world's coconut of the world's at, of the vegetated area of the world's atolls is now covered in coconuts. And that is not the case in atolls that don't have a history of copra plantations. So this is not a natural state of affairs in which coconuts dominate the island. Um, and you might say, okay, but coconuts are lovely, it's food products, it's, um, you know, structural use, it must be really great for the people living there. And absolutely 100%. Um, coconuts are critical culturally, they have many, many values, but the way they're planted now is also ecologically really probably very detrimental. So we know it's really bad for biodiversity. We know that the birds that make the soils on these lands won't use these coconut plantations um, because they're um, not a, a good place for bat nesting and birding um, and raising your chicks. But what we're also starting to learn is that they're also drinking up the fresh water on these atolls. So where is fresh water on atolls? It's in this little shallow lens uh, because the light water sits on top of that salt water, um, that, that um, fresh water sits on top of that salt water. And you get this lens underwater, but the coconut palms drink a lot more than native species do. And they also are much denser than native species. So what we think is happening, and, and I've got a fabulous student whose work I just showed you, Mike Burnett, who's been doing all this, who's actually showing that these coconuts might be drinking two or three times as much water and basically sucking up that freshwater lens. And it's at a particularly critical moment when we're also inundating these atolls with salt water um, from rising sea levels and more washover events. So the idea is that um, this coconut palm 
that we've introduced is, is just dramatically changing the atoll's ability for resilience. Um, and I'll, I'll try to finish up here quickly, but I would say the bright side to all of this is that as much damage as we've done to all kinds of atolls, what we're finding is that atolls are actually amazingly tractable and resilient. So um, some of the work I did on Palmyra looked at kind of the soil development of those islands that the army built in the middle of nowhere. And what we found is that 50 years later, you can't tell the difference between soils that were built on um, by the ar by, between islands that were built by the army and our islands that were built um, without the army, as long as they have native species on them. So if you plant native species on those islands, the soils are indistinguishable from natural soils within 50 years. And it might have been much faster. We just didn't get there until 50 years later to do the research. Um, whereas if you plant coconuts on them 50 years later and now 70 years later, they don't look anything like the native islands. They don't recover because the seabirds can't come there to restore the processes. All these things don't happen. Um, likewise, you know, we're seeing that you can get birds back by putting out fake birds, decoys. These seabirds will come back quickly if you remove the threats that were killing them from these islands and, and attract them back, they'll come back. Coconuts are actually one of those happy invasive species that are really easy to remove. So um, Palmyra Atolls just removed something like a million coconuts from the island and is trying to get the island back to kind of historic levels of where of coconuts as a fringing species. Um, you can eradicate native predators that kill all the seabirds. Um, really, in, in a matter of weeks, they eradicated native rats in Palmyra, non-native rats in Palmyra. So, the the thing that makes atolls so vulnerable their connectivity and their small size also makes them incredibly these like beacons for hope and opportunity to actually restore and their remoteness can be an asset in that there aren't as many pressures on these landscapes to keep using them right that you can protect um, the waters around them from fisheries you can have a chance for recovery and um, palmyra is a really great story of this where they've um, removed rats and they've um, starting to re um, restore coconut palms to more native densities and they're seeing really quick recoveries. So the crab populations, which are so important, we think, for making soils out there are bouncing back within a few years, two to four years when people, you know, without people there eating and predating them. Um, the seabirds are starting to recover and come back. Um, you know, we started to see a few evidence of attraction of new species that maybe weren't there before. So I guess I would say that atolls are this incredible, like, um, opportunity for hope. I, I already talked about this is Palmyra again about these islands um, that can return really, really quickly. And I guess I would say this is a like one of those few places out there in the world where I see like possibilities for win wins, where restoration not only um, brings an island and, and the species that live there back, but they can bring back that restoration is critical to bringing back human livelihoods, critical to bringing back fresh water, um, critical to bringing back um, you know, food sources in terms of the reefs around them and keeping them viable and sustainable. So I would leave you with not a solution to Bonaba because this atoll is such an unusual system and it's going to require us thinking about new and creative solutions. But that's what we've been doing in the last decade or two is thinking about, you know, understanding any ecosystems ecology and then how do you piece it back together again and how can you do that quickly and saying that, you know, I would guess, I don't know, but that based on the resilience of atolls in other systems, that even though this is such a, a unique and um, unusual type of atoll, that the processes that make atolls in general recover so fast might be able to be put to play in a system like this um, to recover this kind of ecosystem as well. Thank you so much, Hillary. And thank you, Katarina, for both of your presentations. I mean, really kind of set this beautiful kind of landscape in which we can kind of, you know, jump off of to think critically about what might be the next steps for restoring Bonaba. And so actually, as we transition now, and we're gonna get creative, we're gonna kind of combine any audience questions. If it comes up, feel free to drop it in the chat. We'll do our best to integrate it to this conversation here. Um, but I wanna start with Hillary. Um, if you could sort of, when you, hear Katarina talk about Bonaba and um you know all of the 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 facets of, of what the island is facing now what are the key questions that come up for you that you ask yourself um in trying to figure out how to restore Bonaba and then Katarina if, if you could you know respond to um the questions that Hillary would pose yeah oh gosh there's so many questions Katarina but I guess yeah. um, one of my questions is kind of 
a little bit about uh, cultural baselines and, and what do the, the people of Banaba know about how the ecology of the system used to work and, and how it would be put back together? Like who was there um, you know, in terms of wild things like plants and animals and, and what is the cultural knowledge and history of what's important in that system? Mm -hmm. like what are the stories passed down of how the system worked? Yeah, yeah. That's such a good question. And, you know, there are some things people know, and then there's a lot of things that people don't know. So one of the problems is most of the population being displaced and living on a com completely different island in a completely different country, which is quite different, uh, has a different landscape from Banaba altogether. And the fact that we now have around four generations, around four generations that have grown up on Rambi Island in Fiji, which was a former copra plantation. And just as you were talking, I was like, oh my gosh, that's why there is all this erosion and challenges with the fresh water and so many things on Rambi, even though that's a volcanic island. That's an atoll. That's not an atoll. But they've had so many environmental issues since being moved there in 1945 and it was an old copra plantation so that's one thing that I was like whoa now in terms of Banaba and what people know about there when I was looking at your diagrams about the relationship between all the different species and the the how each supports the other right through it through living there and how you kind of you you provide nutrition and nourishment for these other species in this this floor in this cycle. Um, one of they did they did terrible things, but one of the things that the colonizers did do is a couple of them were like these um, you know uh, wannabe anthropologists and wannabe historians and wannabe. Um, you know, uh, storytellers who wrote down quite a lot of information about traditional knowledge. Not all of it, but a little bit of it, which I also recognize in contemporary expressions of culture, particularly music and dance, because Pacific people archived their knowledge in music and dance. They didn't write it down. So songs tell you the stories of all the species that you're asking about. Songs, performances, dances, and costumes. The kinds of things that are collected by the Bishop Museum were like, what's that headband? Why is that made of that? Or what's that dancing skirt? Why is it made of that? And they usually decorated with bits and pieces from all of these different species, which are the ones that used to interact together to keep, to build and maintain the island, which is why material culture is so much and why wherever we go with Project Banaba, we're like, what's in your collection? What do you have over there? Because that tells us something about the past and about the kinds of both plant and animal species that existed on the island. So there's a lot of holes in people's knowledge, but they have these songs and dances, which make these references to different kinds of might be fishing practices or different kind of, kinds of animals. So I used to tell my children about all of these different spirits of the land, which included spiders, <laughs> crabs, even like the clouds were part of it. Lots of stingrays, lots of eels, like all of these, you know, different birds, all of these spirits that were identified and passed down and recorded. And I'm like, these are not random spirits. These are actually connected to some of the things that you were showing you in your diagram. So these fish, these crabs, these insects, these things are all uh, recorded in that way in traditional knowledge, but there are still gaps and holes. Mm. Yeah, I, I'd be curious to know, um, you know, do you have like specific examples of these stories of, uh, or, or what do people think now about the kind of what species are important to keep that system functioning? Or is it- I'll be honest, the people on Rambi probably don't think at all about, about it, but the people on Banaba, which is about 300 people, 
they're first they they're living there and they're way more familiar with the environment than than anyone else they were they were returned to banaba as caretakers to kind of look after the land live there and be there because banabans didn't like the idea of no one living on that island they know enough but what's in their way is the debris of the mining so my question especially about your military installations is how much concrete <laughs> and how much stuff is on these things because you're like oh these atolls are growing and they're cool and they're this and I'm like isn't there asbestos isn't there <laughs> like all this other industrial stuff so that was my question about you working to recover these other places that are man-made Banaba isn't just filled with holes it's got a ton of industrial waste on it like rusted everything there's railroad tracks there's broken glass it is jam-packed with an entire what used to be a very high-tech 20th century early 20th century high-tech yeah. industry and none of that's been removed none of that's been removed so they're navigating their way through that industrial wasteland which is also filled with rats. As many rats as you can imagine. I have slept on that island <laughs> on two trips and it was me and the rats all night long. <laughs> um, that thing is filled with rats and, and, you know, not as many birds as would have, you know, this was a nesting place for birds. Yes, um, there don't seem to be as many of those around but there are some very interesting food bearing trees that uh, and very colorful and beautiful kinds of things on the island and then all the gray and the big holes of the limestone so it's a mix i guess and so i mean we have different stories we have a lot of frigate bird stories like Bunnabins used to there was an entire culture shaped around frigate birds and the movement of frigate birds between nauru and banaba they used mm -hmm. to send messages back and forth wow. I had the frigate birds and that's something um my my grand aunt tells that story all the time she claims that marriages were created through <laughs> there's frigate birds you know sending the engagement message back and forth between the islands which is amazing and wonderful but that was some of the first things to disappear with mining they used to take all these photographs of the frigate birds and this extraordinary beautiful cultural practice around the frigate birds and then next minute, like three years later, it's gone. There's no more photographs of, of this interaction between humans and birds. And so we don't know enough. And, and that that report that you mentioned, you know, that came out um, examining the resources of Barnaba, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages long. And this is a report, a technical report that was put together after mining ended and they said, right, what, what can we do with this island now? Like, what's the next steps? And so it's a two volume, massive technical report from London about the island. And under fauna, like you just gave us all these diagrams of like fish and all these beautiful things and plants. Under fauna, it says, there is little wildlife of specific interest. Banaba does not compare with etc cetera, etc cetera, as an area of great ornithological interest which is like shocking to me I'm like the island's made out of bird droppings <laughs> what do you mean there's no plant there is no wildlife you know like here's something that's gone really wrong if the technical report assessing everything is like yeah forget about it with the wildlife so we're not starting from a very good place on this like wildlife front. However, we do know that fish and fishing is still a very big and very important thing off Banaba. And it's very, you know, it doesn't have that reef. It's like there's the island and then there's the deep ocean. Big fish, not little, tiny little <laughs> fish. It's like big fish. So there's still, you know, something there. But I don't know about the interaction between those species and whatever's on the land other than those rats. Yeah. Sorry, before you respond, um, I'm gonna read out a question in the chat that maybe can you can integrate into your response, which is, is there any plan to rehabilitate the physical terrain of Bonaba after removing the industrial detritus? Would the first goal be to rebuild relatively thin layers of permeable soils to rebury the limestone pinnacles? Or do the pinnacles themselves need to be engineered in some manner? So this question's about how, yeah. the, how the pinnacles play into solutions. Yeah. 
Yeah. I know people interested in the pinnacles, that's for sure. I've heard so many like, oh, somebody wants to buy the pinnacles. These pinnacles are so cool and interesting, um, but but nothing's happened um, so far. And all of those things have been considered. Yep. But maybe Hillary has some thoughts. You know, I so I, I have to back up and say, like, I haven't worked in an area that's had phosphate mining. Um, and, you know, I for Palmyra and the systems where I've worked, um, they've actually don't have that scale of like industrial problem yet. Yeah. The military did a relatively good job of cleaning up when they yeah. left compared to what you're dealing with. I mean, it is not clean. They're still removing rusty stuff everywhere. There's um, unexploded ordnance on some islands. It's not perfect. Um, but uh, I think the scale of the problem is is a different order of magnitude. And we also, you know, the places I've worked don't have limestone pinnacles to recover. Um, so I don't have an answer to that. I know we talked earlier and I would say, um, you know, the fresh water, recovering the fresh water is probably where I would start my focus, both for humans and for, for the ecosystem is trying to figure out what physical engineering, if any, needs to be happening to um, try to restore the fresh water quality, which I guess to, to understand what's wrong. So um, just sorry, back up. I've talked to Katrina about this before, which is that the, the fresh water seems to not be potable anymore. Um, and some chemicals from the phosphate have rendered it unpotable. And I'm not um, exactly sure what it is, but there is, um, I suspect it is potable to plants, although I don't know that. Um, but that I would say that the first step would probably be trying to get plants to regrow in order to provide the vegetation and the leaf structure and the filtration of water um, in any natural capacity that's possible um, would yeah. be my first thought is how well actually I don't know the removing the rats might also be a really good stop because yeah. rats not only are keeping your seabirds from resettling they're also keeping um, seeds from germinating right they're going to be extraordinarily mm. effective seed predators of any native plants and particularly larger seeded tree species um, so it's going to be hard to have natural regeneration processes with those rats there. Uh, so that would be two thoughts I would, I would say as to where I would start. I would, I would be trying to figure out what's wrong with my potable water. How do I restore it? How do I get native plants to grow? And I would, I would say, suspect that rats are part of that story. Mm, yep. 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 That's, that's, yep. Yeah, that's really, really, um, helpful and, and, and useful. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say, Absolutely nothing has been done on Banaba to even like for the first centimeter of work towards cleanup, recovery, restoration, dealing with the water. It's always this like external fix, like this weird external fix, like let's add a desalination plant or let's, you know, like let's like parachute in something that it always provides a very short, short term solution, for example, to the drinking water, you know, the company, they just gave up with the water and they shipped in water from Australia. That is thousands of kilometers away. They shipped it and they took the water from the continent and they brought it all the way across the Pacific because they were like, yeah, we don't have water. We're just going to bring it in. So there's also this mentality over, you know, over decades that instead of taking a more integrated, holistic, sustainable and slow approach, like regrowing, you know, trees and plants so that they create that soil between the pinnacles so that they do this work. There's always this like short term parachute in literally down to the, let's just send some bottled water <laughs> over to Banaba, which, you know, lasts all of three seconds. There's also not a regular supply ships at all. There's none for the island. So it's gone from the center of a phosphate universe to nobody's business and nobody cares at all. So I think part of our issues, I think we could come up with some really amazing and interesting integrated conservation based ecologically sustainable kind of thinking. But then there are all these political economic and and distance barriers, you know, logistical barriers to actually doing anything. So there's a lack of political um, willpower and collaboration to even get the spotlight on Banaba 
in the first place. However, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything and we shouldn't put together ideas and thoughts and plans and hopes and dreams because what you've just shared, you know, I can already imagine sending messages through to Banaba now like, hey, you know those rats? <laughs> Let's think about those rats. <laughs> you know, like people are probably like living with the rats. And honestly, when we were there, my father would joke, he was like, the rats are your ancestors. It's all good. I was like, <laughs> these rats are my ancestors. I kid you not. He was like, the rats are your ancestors. The I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, so it was even this like discussion about were these rats indigenous or were they not? And so we really need that kind of information about what kind of species need to be there. Even if some of them are new, like there are some introduced new plants that you wouldn't get rid of necessarily, but there are certain predatory ones that are continuing to cause problems and people on the island need to know that. Um, they're doing their best, they're pretty resilient themselves. There's a lot of kids on the island as well, but they need this kind of information and there's no um, satellite, like no satellite communication or anything like that with Banaba. So you can't really like pick up the phone and call anyone, let alone be on the internet with them so this is like this is like to me it's quite a big thing but it's also because it's two and a half square miles it's quite doable actually you know if the will and the uh the heart was in it um but yeah so such a useful conversation <laughs> and i know we're running out of time you no know, this is this is actually a perfect i'm gonna pose um maybe like a closing question to both of you um to kind of help round us out um, and I guess for Hillary first, um, based off of your experience in various atolls in the Pacific, like what were what are some of the success formulas, whether it be through like ecological formulas or political formulas or like fundraising formulas that worked that you think might be applicable for Bonaba, um, you know, going forward? Um, and then Katarina, um, in addition to responding to, but, but Hillary will share, if you also just want to share with us, like, what do, would you want to see happen next for Banaba in terms of growing? Like, what are like the immediate next steps that you think would be helpful? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we've also talked a little bit about this amongst ourselves, but I think the, the problem is who, who is going to be, um, like there's the dream situation of what would you do next, right? But there's the reality of like, who might actually step up and be interested and engaged enough to um, to do to do something? Who might actually, you know, what governments, what agencies might you reach out to and actually be engaged in this? Um, I, I personally work a lot with environmental nonprofits. And so my thought would be to actually like, see if you could engage people as a, as a, again, in one of these ideas of hope spots, of ideas where you might have a potential of recovery and restoring both win-wins for biodiversity and for people. So might you be able to reach out to um, kind of environmental nonprofits or organization, you know, th these could be an important bird area, these could be some of that um, perspective and see if, if there's a way to work together with restoring communities and restoring um, the wildlife in those systems. Because I, I honestly think, as you mentioned, Katarina, these kind of externally driven solutions of shipping in water um, or, you know, putting in a desalinization plant are probably not sustainable for places out in the middle of nowhere like that. So I really think it's going to be about um, trying to restore the system is a long term solution. And who who are your partners in that? I would think about people that are interested not only in the human cultural part, where you know, especially if the country of Kiribati is not able um, to invest heavily right now in that is is maybe reaching out to some of the partners that might see the the future and the potential of in of conservation in this area, um, especially if the local community is interested and engaged. So that was one of the questions I didn't really get to pose with you and talk to you is like, would this be something they'd want to do, right? Or are they at such a point where they want to just like, you know, I have immediate needs. I can't think about, you know, if a, if the seabirds are going to land, we're going to, um, you know, maybe eat them or I don't know, right? Like that, uh, what is what is the buy-in from the local community for doing ecological restoration, which might have a 50 or 100 year timeline for seeing real responses. Um, anyways, so I guess I would say where to go next. I would probably start with some thinking about how to restore the system, which would be kind of reaching out to conservation and perhaps to scientists um, to think about how you actually restore it from 
internally because you know i've never worked on phosphate mining but there's probably people who could answer some of these questions about how would you kind of restore water quality in a, in a phosphate mined area um that's probably where i would go wonderful yep that is that is so useful and helpful and you know for my final remarks i'm going to answer that you know question you posed at the end right away about what is the interest of the people themselves and you know what i would say is it's diverse you know one of the things that mining did was it really broke the community in so many different ways and what happened is they replaced land with money. So there was like this swap between land, which then people increasingly did not have access to, land that was something that was passed down and shared between families, passed down through the generations and everyone had rights and access to land. And then the entire land system, uh, tenure system was changed and that changed the nature of how people live together, shared resources and work together. So once that land system was broken, everything else kind of started to fall apart and become really complicated after that. So now when we try to talk to people about what, what they need, there's a, there's, there, I would say something like, Two fifths of Bonobans are like, we want our money. <laughs> Is there any more money? You know, and they, their mind immediately goes to, well, this island's always been about money and that's what happened. And, you know, if we can make some money off this land, let's go down that road. And then there's probably three fifths who are like, no, this is like, this land is our mother. And this is where my grandmother and my great grandmother, and my great, great grandmother come from. And don't you dare touch that land. And so there's actually an ongoing um, tension amongst people right now about what to do with the island and what other priorities and what is the right steps going forward. So some people, including some of our leaders think, yep, let's get some more mining companies in and see if they can help. <laughs> it's like, what kind of help would you get from a mining company? But that's because they want to pay their bills and pay off the debts that have been accumulated to the Rambi Council of Leaders. And then there's other people who are quite staunch about safeguarding and protecting the island and are, would probably be deeply interested in what you've just outlined because they're also looking for sources to reconnect in terms of heritage in terms of identity, in terms of the material landscape, they would be very happy to walk across the landscape and learn and try to remember and recall and repair and restore. So our community is unfortunately quite divided right now with not everyone on the same page. Now that's pretty normal. That's pretty normal for any community. You can't get them all on the same page, but it doesn't make it easier that Fiji and Kiribati and the community can't also all come together together and prioritize well health, well-being, and support for Bonobans. So we're still kind of falling through critical cracks and there's no like proper governance and systems in place to even have those conversations in a way that could be productive. But there is hope and there is creativity and there's resilience and there's attempts by wonderful people on the ground to try to make something happen and to stand up to safeguard the island. So that's definitely happening. Thank you so much to both of you and to everybody for joining us for, for tonight. And, you know, we're kind of reaching the tail end of our time together. And obviously there's so much more to mine from this conversation. There's so much more to that, that this conversation will inspire. Never ending mine. <laughs> Never ending mine. Um, and, you know, I just kind of want to share, I want to mahalo, um, uh, Geraldo for um, adding something in this chat here, which I'm going to kind of help utilize in, as, a, as a way to maybe close, but what Geraldo Farrington said in the chat, which I think is um, really apt, is that, you know, the challenges of restoration ecology can be daunting and even depressing, but the story of Bonobo with all of its challenges, and yet it's relatively small scale, can help to motivate and inspire and educate people around the world, and that, and so, Yes, it's just like reemphasizing, I think, what all, what you've all been been sharing with us this evening and and Hillary, all your work in in, in atolls in the Pacific is just um, you know, it helps it helps for you know islands like Bonaba to think through like what what it can do to to regrow um and revitalize. So um 
just Mahalo new everybody for your time with us today. This is recorded. This will be put up online in about a week. Um, and so we encourage everybody to share this. Um, and because these key questions are ones that need to be repeatedly asked. And, um, you know, I'll just I'll just sort of give both Hillary and Kati just one more opportunity to say final closing words and mahalo, and then we'll 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 end for today. I just want to acknowledge Mary from PIDP who is with us today too, and thank uh, Pacific Islands Development Program for sharing, um, you know, and sh um, spreading the word about this gathering as well. So so lovely to see you there. Um, in the ether, Mary, and everyone else, Geraldo, Cynthia, uh, I can see Toby, lots of people have been commenting. Um, and I really, really ap appreciate your engagement. So I hope um, Taylor uh, and Ryan, we can save the chat as well, because I will go and read the chat. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just close by saying thank you and thank you um, particularly to, to Taylor and your team at Bishop um, for hosting us and Katrina for teaching me so much about Banaba. Thank you, Hillary. You've been amazing. I've been <laughs> it's been a wonderful learning experience for me too. Yeah. Continue to be continued. Um, and shout out to Hawaii Council for the Humanities for sponsoring this program and for also just being a huge support for the exhibition. Um, mahalo nui. Have a beautiful evening, everybody. And until next time, to be continued. Thank you. Well,